This is the High School Football America podcast for March the 24th, 2020. I'm Jeff Fisher. The High School Football America podcast is brought to you by GameStrat, America's premier sideline instant replay system with fabulous, shall I say, outstanding customer service and especially its reliability. And they have different plans priced right for every coach's budget. To get a demo, go to GameStrat.com or click on the GameStrat banner ad located on every page of HighSchoolFootballAmerica.com. All right, heading to Dallas, Texas. Yeah, Big D. And uh, as we've been doing over the last week, uh, last, I guess it was last Monday, I put out a, uh, a tweet on Twitter uh, asking people to retweet, and then they could come on and promote their, their kids and their program and their coaching staff. And uh, the, the man on the line right now, Josh Ragsdale, the uh, new head coach, the Conrad Chargers in the Dallas ISD is on the line. He uh, has been uh, in the uh, Dallas ISD a couple of times as a head coach. Uh, this one uh, brand new, obviously, Adamson back in the day. We're going to talk about that back in 2000. 2010. He spent some time at uh, South Garland as well, and Josh is on the line to uh, talk about his brand new job, which is getting a little bit of a slow start because of COVID-19, <laughs> but welcome to the show, Coach. Well, thank you. You know, when I pushed retweet, and then I saw that you, that I was chosen, you know, the first thing I thought was, uh-oh, what did I do? Because, <laughs> man, I don't know a whole lot about this place yet, but I'm, I'm ready to talk about it. Well, that's good. And uh, before we roll tape here, folks, uh, Coach told me that he's also done some uh, some radio broadcasts for football. So he, he's, he's okay. He's, he's, he's going to be fine and be able to rock and roll with this. But we'll go with, you know, things right at the top. Uh, I think you said four days in, yeah, oops, no longer the uh, head coach where you can talk to the kids and work out with the kids. So tell me a little bit about how you're handling that. I also know you have a unique way that you know a little bit more about your team, so you can kind of blend all that together for us here. Well, I'll tell you this, and, and I've said this before. I've said this in interviews for other jobs. I think coaches are the masters of adjustment. And I, to be completely honest with you, what we're doing now, uh, coaches really across America, is, is something we probably most have already been doing. And so when it comes to the online learning, when it comes to the uh, staying in contact with your kids. You know, we've got teachers that are probably reaching out to coaches right now saying, how have you always done this? And, and that's what's so neat about the coaching profession is I think we have kind of a, a leg up on, on just the, the normal teachers because this is something that we've gotten used to doing. And so um, it's been refreshing. It's been different. Um, gotten to learn a, a little bit about the staff, a little bit about, uh, about some of the students through this. But I, I tell you, coaches are masters of adjustment, not only in games, not only, you know, in practices when weather hits, but when something like this hits, you're not truly ready for it. But I think a lot of the things that coaches do have had them prepared four times like this. Yeah, and, and, you know, the great thing, and I've mentioned this to several coaches, is, you know, I, I'm an old guy, right? I, I, I had a rotary phone when I was growing up. But kids these days are technologically sound, so A, you can learn from them, and B, it's not as hard to get across the fact that you're going to do some online learning, right, or FaceTiming or whatever it is. <laughs> That's correct. I mean, these kids, they, they haven't figured out, you know, they, I was two days on the job and I started getting text messages from kids. Hey coach, this is so and so, this is so and so. And I'm looking around like, how do they know my number? I mean, how do they even <laughs> find me, you know, number one, but uh, yeah, this, this is, you know, this is something that these that the young folks are, are, are truly prepared for because this is something that they're good at. Obviously I'm having to learn some things. I use zoom for the first time, blew my mind. Didn't know that you could do that. And, was able to look at people as I talked to them. I thought you could only do that with FaceTime, but uh, there, there's so many resources out there that, that, that have really, like I said, that have gotten people prepared for this. Talking Conrad Chargers football here on the High School Football America podcast. Uh, Josh Ragsdale just getting the job. And I, I mentioned at the top there that uh, you, you had a little bit of a, a, a leg up uh, that you were telling me before we rolled some tape on uh, getting to know your kids before you actually got the job. Explain that to the listeners. It's kind of a funny story. I'll tell you, back in uh, 1994, one of my best friends was struck by lightning on the football field. His name was Clay Jones. And if you were to look up Clay Jones, uh, you would see he was from Forney, Texas. I played for the Forney Jackrabbits. And he was struck and he was killed. Um, and since then, there's been a track meet, the Clay Jones Memorial Track Meet, that I've attended every year ever, ever since uh, the incident happened. And so um, I just happened to, I, I'm looking like, oh, you know, the Clay Jones Track Meet's on Thursday. So, this was the week before I was officially hired. Um, I knew it was going to happen, but nothing was official yet at Conrad. But I attended the meet. Me and my dad went, and lo and behold, there's the Conrad uh, Chargers. So had an opportunity to watch them run, had an opportunity to really 
just see how they talk to others. I walked up and shook a couple of them's hands, didn't tell them who I was, uh, just to see what their reaction was. And, and really, you can gauge what kind of, of young man that they are when they don't know who they're talking to. And so I had some good conversations and then finally, you know, broke the news. Hey, I'm, I'm coach Ragsdale. I'm going to be the next head football coach. And just to see the smile on their face uh, was neat, you know, but, but the, the best part of it was being able to see how they reacted. One kid uh, pulled up, uh, hurt his hamstring, had an opportunity to go over and just speak with him just to see, um, you know, what's hurting, you know, is there anything I can do for you? And just hearing how uh, cordial he was and how he represented himself uh, gave me a good feeling knowing that I'm about to inherit a group of, of good kids. And so they haven't won a whole lot on the football field, but uh, it's obvious in the way that they carried themselves that this was going to be a group that I was going to be able to work with. And, and they were going to be able to understand um, some of the things that are unconventional that we're going to do in our program uh, simply with the way they, they you know reacted to me or the way that they interacted with me before they even knew who I was. Right. So it was neat to see them run. It was neat to see them win the four-by-one. I saw them win the four by two, so we've got some athletes to work with as well. So that's that's exciting. And we're going to get to some of them by by name, but uh, before we get to that, and we are talking to Josh Ragsdale, the the new head coach at the of the Conrad Chargers in in Dallas, Texas, talking some Texas high school football, and uh, mentioned you had some success uh, when you took over at Adamson when that was a program that didn't have a whole lot of winning going on. So, kind of a two part question is: What did you do there to turn things around, and is that still the same kind of thumbprint you're going to try and to use here today in in 2020 uh with conrad you know when i first first got to adamson i got there in 07 as a defensive coordinator and uh they were on a, a 31 game losing streak and i was young i was under 30 um people ask me why you know i was in, in my hometown not my hometown but i was living in crandall um so i was i was coaching at crandall and people ask why why would you number one why would you go into dallas why would you go to a program that that hasn't been winning and my, my answer If you tell me that something can't be done, um, that strikes a match under me. And, and like I've talked recently, and I'll get to in a little bit with our with our guys at Conrad, is it lights that fire in me that basically says, "Watch this, watch this." If you think we can't, watch this. And so, got to Adamson as the DC, uh, and the big thing was, you know, right place, right time. Uh, Andy Gutierrez uh, was the head coach, who's now the head coach of Dallas Seagullville, has been very successful there. Uh, but we, we instilled an attitude in those kids that. You know, why not us? You know, we will win, you know, and we just basically spoke it into existence and the kids are ready for a change. They were hungry because they wanted to win. They weren't complacent. They weren't the type of kids that were just excited about running through a tunnel. They weren't just the kids that were excited about senior night and getting their pictures with their girlfriends on the sidelines after a game. They wanted to win. And so anything that we asked them to do, they did. Uh, and obviously that that's the connection you got to make with young men nowadays to in order to win. And so we, we went six and four that first year, didn't make the playoffs, but from 0 and 31 to six and four, that was pretty, pretty big change. Oh yeah. Going into year two, year two, we were better. We were a better football team. The next year was a realignment year. Uh, and, and crazily enough, the teams that Adamson had lost to for 10 previous years, didn't want to play Adamson anymore. And so that got a little bit interesting in scheduling. So we started playing a tougher schedule, which we really needed. It was a good way to test where we were. But we ended up 2-8. and eight. We lost our best player in our first scrimmage, uh, Roger Goodlow. He went on to play at Northwestern. Uh, so losing a caliber player like him you know, really affected everybody. Then going into year three, we were really worried that you know this was a possible 0-10 season because we had lost our athletes. Uh, but here's the thing. The kids had bought in. The kids believed in what we were doing. And, and that – uh, was so neat to see because not only did we have, you know, we started off 0-3 thinking, okay, this is exactly where we thought we were going to be. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, something sparked with our kids. And, and they remembered what we had told them the previous two years about we can do it. You know, don't listen to the outsiders. Don't listen to what people are saying you can't do. And we made the playoffs, which, which you know, you usually don't want to gauge your program on just making the playoffs. But when it's the first time your program's been in the playoffs since 1981, Wow. Uh, in the previous time, it's 1946. <laughs> uh, making the playoffs was a pretty big deal. And yeah. so, uh, and then, obviously, you, we go in as the, I think at the time, the top three teams made the playoffs. I can't remember for sure. Uh, we drew Lincoln, Dallas Lincoln, who, you know, just a couple of years previous had played in the state championship. And we're sitting there thinking to ourselves, oh, no. You know, we've made the playoffs. Now we're going to play, you know, number five team in the state. 
you know, this isn't going to go well. And I'll be dang, they beat us 21-17. to um, And it was such a good game. It was a Thursday night game, so all of Dallas was there because uh, they were interested to see what, what was Adam doing. And so um, after that year, uh, it was a fun year. Coach Gutierrez left Bigfield, which was a lot closer to his house. Um, and I was able to take over. We made the playoffs one more time in 2012. So that was another neat experience. Had a young man named Drayden Taylor who went on to play in New Mexico. Um, he was the first person in, in Adamson School. And Adamson was built in 1915. So when you talk about school records, dating all the way back to 1915, that's pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. He was able to play in two playoff games his freshman year and his, his senior year. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. And so we, we really had things rolling. We, we did not have a giant group of athletes, but we had a group of men who I still talk to to this very day. We built relationships with those kids that have carried on and that will probably last forever. And that's why they played so hard for us. Talking so, to Go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm saying so that I really think those relationships is what allowed us to do what we wanted to do. And then does that that roadmap you used back then, is that something that you look at as you, as you come to Conrad? It is because, you know, in the short time I've been with them, I think it's very obvious that they want, they want to do better. They want to win. Um, so anything that, you know, we're telling them right now, you can just tell they're eating up and, and they're, they're believing. And, and that, that's really what it takes. And, you know, when, when I got to South Garland, I'm not saying that those kids didn't want to win, but it was just a little bit different environment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a different than, than, than what I would consider an inner city environment. Those kids in South Garland – had trainers, they had people outside of, of football that that they constantly were, you know, were talking with and were getting help from. So, wasn't quite as much buy-in as, as what we had at Adamson, uh, but we did have uh, enough kids that did buy-in. That same deal, you know, we, we inherited a program that was 0 10 uh, the previous year, struggled that first year, just really trying to, to to make some changes that needed to be made, and then finally, you know, got over that hump and, and broke the losing streak. I think at the time it was up to like 22 or 25. Uh, so to, to break that losing streak was, was big. And then in the year after, um, being able to put together back-to-back wins, you know, first time since like 2015, I believe, maybe 2012. It was 2012, I think. Um, that was big. And so we had things rolling, um, you know, had things heading in the, in the right direction. But I'm telling you, what we did is similar to what we're about to do at Conrad because those kids are they're ready. They're excited. They are ready to uh, uh, to show what they can do, and, and they're listening to us. So when we're telling them to do something, they're doing it. They're not saying why. And what's neat is when I gave them my first speech where I talked about people telling me that something can't be done, people have said, Coach, you can't win at Conrad. Why would you do that? Why are you putting yourself through this again? And just sit back and say, well, watch this. If you think we can't, watch this. And I know the kids are listening because they're tweeting and when they're tweeting, they're hashtagging, watch this. And they're texting me, they're, they're hashtagging, watch this. So uh, I think the kids kind of have the same mindset that I do. Sounds like you, you like a little bit of a challenge there. Before we get to the kids, Coach, the one thing I want to uh, you know, educate the listeners around the nation, obviously Texans know their high school football, and none of this will be new to them. But I would think the people around the, the nation listening going, okay, Dallas, yeah, I get the Cowboys. You know, I, I think I heard a Dallas Carter from a film. <laughs> Uh, but I was going to say, since you've, you've been in the, the district a couple of times and you mentioned the inner city part of it, tell us a little bit about you know some of those challenges or some of the good things about being in the school district and, and kind of, I guess, put on the ambassador hat a little bit and, and, and talk a little bit about uh, Dallas ISD and, and its football tradition. Well, I'll tell you this, Dallas ISD has 22 comprehensive high schools. So if you sit there and think about that for a second, one district, there's 22 high schools. So when you start doing the math, when you start talking budgeting, when you start talking money, it's difficult. And you're not going to have a budget that you would get. When I was at South Garland, when there, there, there was only seven high schools, um, which is still a lot, but seven is a lot different than 22. So when it comes to funds, it's a little bit tougher because you've got to spread it around so much. But I will tell you this, you've got communities that are there to help. And, and, and Oak Cliff, the old Oak Cliff, and, and to kind of put some things into perspective, W.H. Addison High School built in 1915. If you've ever studied the Kennedy assassination, uh, when when um, Officer Tippett was, you know, allegedly shot by uh, Lee Harvey Oswald after the uh, after he killed the president, that actually happened, which is what is now is Adamson's campus. 
Oh. And so that area is so rich in history. You can walk down the street and be at the Texas Theater where Oswald was arrested. Just around the corner, you can go to the house on Beckley Street, another house that you've seen Oswald hold the rifle. And so there's a lot of history in that town, and, and people love their Adamson Leopards. And it's really similar in a lot of the, a lot of the, the small little towns within Dallas. Um, now, you've heard of the Dallas Carters, you know, because of Friday Night Lights and, and the, the movies that they made. But there's so much neat, you know, so many neat things. Here's the cool part about Dallas, too, is what money is invested, uh, tax money, whatever, you know, wherever you talk about getting your money from for school districts from the state. They do some neat things with the school. Um, we've got something different than, than what any other school in the, in the district has. We have a restaurant. So you walk into our building. Not only do we have our cafeteria, but we have a restaurant. Neat. And so what that restaurant's doing is really teaching those kids, you know, we would love to say everybody's going to college, but reality says probably not happening. And so we, we're, we're graduating young men and women that are workforce ready. And so they're able to, to really they learn what it takes to not only work in a restaurant, but to, to run a restaurant and be a manager or be an owner of the restaurant. Um, when I was at Adamson, we had a gigantic auto tech. So you walk in, it was like walking into a mining key. There was eight lifts. I mean, tons of kids walk in. It's it just a, they really, the district does a wonderful job of getting people ready for the workforce. And so when you start talking football, Dallas has won, and Dallas has, has been successful. The one thing they're wanting to get back to is winning state championships. In basketball, their state championships won at probably at least once a year. Um, that success has always been there. When you look in the NBA, you're going to see tons of players that come from Dallas ISD. Uh, Dallas Madison, most recently, is, was trying to win uh, back-to-back state championships and was about to play in a state championship before our, our tournament was postponed. So every year that success is there. We've got to find a way to get that going in football. And Dallas Carter, you know, the, the story of Carter winning the state championship, having to forfeit, um, so there's really only two schools in, in Dallas ISD that have won state championships. And that is Dallas Sunset, which is Dallas Adamson's big rival, and it's Dallas Adamson. And they weren't known as Dallas Adamson at the time. They were Oak Cliff High School. But those are the two schools that have won state championships in football. And so our new athletic director, Sylvia Salinas, is really making changes. And what they're starting to see is we're behind the suburbs. We're behind the suburbs in facilities. We're behind – in resources, for instance, my kids can't afford these personal trainers that maybe kids in Highland Park or kids in South Lake are able to afford. But what we're starting to do is make those facility changes that are hopefully even better than what some of the suburbs have to kind of make up for that lack of mm-hmm. our kids being able to to afford those trainers. If that makes sense to you. Yeah. And yeah. so that's one thing Sylvia's doing, um, Dr. Salinas and she was an assistant athletic director when I left the district, and now that I'm back in the district, she is the executive athletic director. And it's amazing to see the changes that have happened from when I left to when I came back. And that's coaches' salaries, that's stipends, that's facilities. Um, she's worked to get five or six weight rooms totally redone, which is amazing. Um, they're working on trying to get turf fields on campuses. Hopefully that eventually happens. Might not, but it might. Um, so there's a lot of things that are in place. To, to try to to catch up with the suburbs because of the lack of, of, of money when it comes to our, our actual players. I read a tweet today. That this, this really puts a lot of things into perspective because I know this is going to happen with us. I read a tweet that said and it was to their teacher, an email to their teacher saying, I'm not available from online classes until after 8 tonight because my dad's making me work. He's hired me at his job. And – that's going to happen a lot. And when a kid in the inner city, when a kid in Dallas, when I first got there, it took a little adjusting for me. Mm-hmm. Kid says, Coach, I won't be late for practice because my mom's in jail and I've got to go pick up my little sister from daycare. My initial response was, get your butt out to the practice field. But then I think to myself, wait a minute. And it was as true as can be. He was 30 minutes late for practice with his little sister in tow, sat her down, got her homework out for her, put his helmet on and came out and finished practice. And so those are things that, being in the inner city that we, we we have to adjust to that you might not see in the suburbs. Yeah. Not saying that doesn't happen in the suburbs, but it's happening a lot more in the inner city. So that's where I've learned to to have more empathy for these kids, have more empathy for their situations, what they go through. And that empathy leads to those relationships. And those relationships lead to them doing everything that they can for us 
because they know that we love them. Yeah. So that's the neatest part about working in the inner city is now you can't fake it. You can't fake the love because the kids are they're smart enough to tell it. Oh, they'll know. <laughs> they do sense that you love them, and they're doing it for their well-being. You can get them to do amazing things. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons I love the profession of coaching and salute it and try and promote it as much as I can because uh, that story you just told there, unfortunately, is told in a lot of inner cities around the country. Uh, I, I know my buddy Jason Strunk, who used to be the head coach at Lubbock, would uh, would tell me about some of the things that you just said there about that. You know, uh, you know, thirteen year olds uh, actually because the parents, both parents, were in jail, were being the the parents to their their six and seven year olds. It's it's absolutely yeah. amazing. Josh Ragsdale is on the line. Head coach at Conrad in Dallas, and uh, let's let's talk about some of these kids here. Uh, the, you, you got a little bit of a snapshot uh, at the track meet, and then you got four days with them. So, uh, who are some of the kids that you expect some leadership out of? And I bet you, you know, while it's not a good time, right? This downtime is not a good time. You also are going to see, like you said, when kids are texting and all that, what kids really want it, right? Correct. I mean, it's a good barometer of exactly where they're at. Uh, commitment wise, and, you know, and I told them, you know, my commitment level is going to stay high. And as long as my commitment level matches yours, if your commitment level will match mine or be on pace to match mine, you know, we're going to do some good things. I'm, I'm going to try to get some things done, some things that they've asked about. Coach, can we get our names put on back of our jerseys? You know, one thing I've told them, I said, here's the deal. Yes, as long as your commitment level matches mine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and this was before the break, this was before the school got canceled and postponed this is while we were still in school so i've got to get creative now and engage in where the commitment level is meaning hey send me some pictures of you working out send me some videos of you working out and the kids have done that um what's neat is that stuff that we've already done i've done that at other schools during spring breaks during christmas breaks you know just kind of being funny more than anything it's amazing how now you know it's kind of serious you know show me you're still working out show me you're doing something other than sitting in front of a tv with a PlayStation remote, you know, in your hand. And mm-hmm. so uh, one kid, a uh, kid named Tony King, he's a sophomore this year. You know, he, he started on varsity at receiver um, in, in, in the secondary. And that's one of the first people that, that stuck out to me when I was looking at this job and I was doing my research on the job and, and watching film and seeing the playmaking ability that he has. And, and the ball is in his hands in the open field. It, it's it's kind of unfair. It's some of the things that he's able to do and, how he's able to expose some people on defense. And, and so I'm excited about Tony. Tony's been one of those first guys that, that texted me, reached out to me, and, and he's kind of been my go-to guy uh, when it comes to kind of gauging what – and here's the thing. When you, when you take over a program, you've got people that are invested, and you've got seniors-to-be that are four years invested in this thing or three years invested. And so one of the things that I try to do, too, is not only gauge – the things they want to see done differently. You know, how would you want this? Or how do y'all like doing this? Would you like doing this? And, but what I also have to make sure, because they are invested and they've spent time in the program, is find out what are some of those things maybe they don't want to see change. Because it's not fair to me to come in as the new head football coach, athletic coordinator, and change everything. Mm-hmm. Because they're invested. They put time in. So finding out, hey, what are some things that y'all have been doing that you want to see continue? Not necessarily traditions, we're going to continue traditions. What are some of the small things uh, that, that you've been doing? So Tony's kind of been my go-to for that. Uh, another young man, Kevin Bailey, who's a transfer, who was not able to play varsity this next year, um, I believe came from Cedar Hill. You know, Cedar Hill's got a lot of tradition oh, in yeah. winning state championships and, and, and in a wonderful program. Just picking his brain. What are some things that happened there? What are some things that y'all did? So he's been, again, he's a great athlete, too. He was on that four-by-one that I, I mentioned earlier. At the forty meet that wanted, it, uh, it's it neat to talk to those guys who, not only, not only are great athletes and, and it's no secret that they're good athletes because they've shown it, but now seeing that they want to be leaders as well. And so, the big thing is in developing leaders, you you, you got to put them in leadership roles. You know, it's hard to develop a leader that's not leading. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you you learn those skills by doing. Now, there's some people that you just look at and go, you know what, that's probably not the smartest person to have in front of your team as a leader. And uh, you got to use some common sense when it comes to that. But these two young men have already, you know, kind of stood out. And it, it's neat when we talk about the uh, watch this, you know, watch this. I hear, it, I hear it being said down the hallway. So I know they're listening. I know they're talking about it. Um, and it's neat when your, your best athletes are doing it. 
if your best athletes aren't bought in, you're in trouble. Yep. But if your best athletes are bought in, you got a chance. And that's what gets us so excited about the season that I think we're about to have is that the athletes, the, the ones that are looked at the most as far as the success of the program goes, they're the ones that are buying in, and that's what's so exciting. And you sound like you're chomping at the bit, that's for sure. Uh, no contact yeah. with the players. like all. all so the, the good news is, right, the, the playing field is even when it comes to yeah. no, no one's able to work out. There's nothing going on on the side. Josh Rags, Ragsdale is on the line. Conrad Chargers in, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, you know, it, it kind of dawned on me, this, this question. It may go a little little left of where we were with the kids, but uh, and I'm very positive. I do think that there will be a 2020 high school football season. I think we're going to get back – the normal sooner than later. We got to be smart about it and all that. But but here's my question. Let's let's go to the negative side for just a second. What if this doesn't work out, right? And your seniors, and now you're going to have some kids that you know we're counting on this maybe to get out, right? Get out of the inner city yeah. situation or whatever. Uh, now we're talking mental health here, and and we all know that coaches are everything from a coach to a parent sometimes to a therapist sometimes. Uh, have you thought about that? And and you know what what would be your advice if we get to that? situation of what you're going to talk to these young men about you know i, I I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because I, I i made a comment recently on twitter um someone posted about our, our uil our university of scholastic league and someone said you know why, why are we saying april 3rd or why are we saying why don't we just say it's canceled for good and and one of my comments was it's very obvious that our athletic directors at the uil they, they have core values and two of those core values is, especially one of them is hope. And so I think the biggest thing that people need right now is, is definitely is hope. And so, um, you know, that, that's, that, that does cross my mind. Um, if it does anything, you know, and obviously this isn't something that I would preach to our seniors, but I would preach to our younger kids is, is how do we learn from this? And so number one is you, you, you take every opportunity that you're given in life and you make something of it. And those of you that are now seniors, you know, you look back and, and you don't want to live with those regrets. Chad Morris is a good friend of mine, and he talked about three things you can't ever get back, and one of them is your time. And it's very true. We can't go back. We can't change what's happened. We can't change what you did as a freshman, sophomore, junior. We can't change what you, the time you spent in the classroom. Another thing is opportunity, and it, it's taking advantage of every opportunity that you get. Uh, and another thing is your words. You can't ever get your words back. But talking about opportunity and, and that time, and hopefully our young kids learn from this and that, hey, from my freshman year on, I'm on the clock. And I've got to be able to do everything I can to get those colleges' attention. And if you're waiting till your senior year to get their attention, you've done the process wrong mm -hmm. or you've been taught the process wrong. And so, once again, that's not going to fix how our seniors feel. I feel horrible for them if, if they were to lose the season. But it goes back to what I said about UIL and having those core values and hope being one of them that, you know what, we're going to get through this, and this is going to happen for you. Um, and, and, you know, another thing is there's opportunities out there all across, you know, uh, really all across America when it comes to college football. If the ability is there, if you've got the ability to play the game, um, it's, it's really, I look at it no different than those seniors who haven't taken things seriously and they get through their senior year, they don't have those offers. You know, it's, at what point do you say, dude, it's because you didn't take care of your business. Mm -hmm. You didn't take care of your business in the classroom. That's a difficult conversation to have, even when they have a senior year. But my thing is, if, if you're a player, there's a place out there for you. There's places out there that, that don't have as high of academic standards that will give you an opportunity to play, just as if you did play your senior year. And so um, I really don't know how to convey the message other than, you know, trying to stay positive until that day comes when they say, there's no way. I didn't think the day was going to come where Dallas County said, we're, we're, we're stuck at home. Do not leave our houses. I never thought that day would come. And, and when people talked about it, I thought, there's no way we're not going to get to that. But you know what? We're here now. And so the good thing is we made preparations for that as a family. We made preparations, um, hopefully, as a community to make sure that we can stop this, this spread. But going back to the senior deal, it's, you know, if you're a young kid, you got to learn from this because those opportunities aren't always going to be there. And I've had kids that been recruited because of what they've done their sophomore year. I've had kids recruited because of what they've done their senior year. And so the big thing is, is keep your head up, keep working. 
same with the academics. I know right now the last thing that they want to do is wake up, get on the laptop, and have some online learning. But you know what? This might be what projects your your GPA forward. This might be your opportunity to improve from what coaches need to see or what the, the colleges need to see from your transcripts. So, but it goes back to if you don't take this serious and you don't focus and you don't finish, um, then you're, you're just eliminating your opportunity. And so uh, I think there's a lot of lessons to be taught um, and to be learned, but your question is valid in that I don't know. I don't know what my, my language will be. I don't know what my mindset will be if they say, guess what, we're not going to have a 2020 season. Um, I'm not really quite prepared for that, but the good thing is I've got time to sit in the house. I've got time to study. I've got time to learn and maybe figure out exactly what I am going to need to say when that time comes. Well, I, I'm very positive. I, I, I believe with all my heart that the good Lord upstairs is going to have us have a 2020 season. And again, I'm not discounting that there's a lot of things that have to happen before that. But, you know, we want everybody to be safe and healthy, of course. Uh, and Coach, I just really appreciate you taking the time. That uh, that last question there, there was a lot of great nuggets in there. Uh, I think for uh, whether it's fellow coaches listening here or players, uh, take heed to what uh, Coach Ragsdale said there. There's some, some neat things that you should be thinking about. Coach, I really appreciate you taking time out of your uh, not as busy schedule as normal, <laughs> but coach really appreciate yeah. it. A sense of humor is needed at this time too. So uh, best yeah. of luck Amen. in 2020. We hope that the uh, Chargers have a season and a successful season. We look forward to following you down the road. Awesome. Thank you so much. And don't forget to join us on Twitter for the third straight day. We're bringing the High School Football America community together by sharing. Uh, The first day, we shared our favorite high school football stadiums and fields. On Monday, it was share your alma mater's helmet. And today, we're sharing high school football traditions. Brought to you by uh, Brian Schomloffel, the uh, head coach at West Hampton Beach High School on Long Island in New York. Everybody keep uh, healthy and safe out there. And while you're in, why not uh, post your high school football tradition on the uh, thread on our handle at HSFA. Oops, I got that wrong. <laughs> There's a thunderstorm here in Atlanta right now. Where Our handle on Twitter is HSFB America. I've only said that about a million times over the last decade. Anyway, everybody keep safe and be very, very healthy out there. I'm Jeff Fisher, and you've been listening to the High School Football America podcast that is brought to you by GameStrat, America's premier sideline instant replay system with outstanding customer service and different price plans for every coach's budget. We know you all have different ones. To get a demo, go to GameStrat.com or click on the GameStrat banner ad located on every page of HighSchoolFootballAmerica.com.